Good afternoon. You're all supposed to say hi. 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 We want to sort of bring you back. You know, after lunch sessions are always very difficult. And so that's why they put us after lunch. Uh, my name is Casey Green. I'm the founding director of the Campus Computing Project. Campus Computing is the largest continuing study of computing, information technology, and e-learning in American higher education. Our tagline is, everybody else has opinions. We try to bring data to the conversations about e-learning and information technology in higher ed. Our panel today is titled, From Dewey to Digital, Our Ebooks, Tablets, and Digital Content Coming of Age. We're going to have a very active conversation with five folks who, drawing on the, the metaphor of the African parable about the blind guys, these guys are obviously not blind, but the blind guys touching the elephant. We're going to touch different parts of the elephant about the movement to digital curricular resources in the higher education market. Uh, let me very quickly do introductions, my left to your right. Yes. Okay, so closest, that's a geographic, it's not a political statement. You have to be very careful about that in election years. So immediately to my left and your right is Matt McGinnis, who is the founder and CEO of Inkling. Sitting next to Matt is Jim Danke, who is the director of the Future of Print Project at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, in the middle, again, that's geographic, it's not political. <laughs> Actually, and you'll see there'll be more significance to that positioning as the conversation goes forward, <laughs> is Vineet Madan, who is the Senior Vice President of Strategy and Business Development at McGraw-Hill Higher Education. Uh, next to the neat is Osman Rashid, who is the co-founder and CEO of No. And at the far right, again, geographic, not political, at the risk of trying to push too much on this joke, uh, is Sean Devine, who is the CEO of CoreSmart. Before we begin with the panel, we want to do two kinds of polling of this group. We want to do the old-fashioned way, and then we want to do a high-tech way. Uh, many of you have been here with us all morning. Some of you are sort of churning. We've had a rope line going on. Uh, we'd like to know who you are. So again, the old-fashioned way, with a show of hands, how many of you have a primary affiliation with a college or university? Please raise your hands. We will not ask if your college or university is paying for your CES travel expenses or the drinks in the bar. Uh, keep those hands up, all right? Thank you. And of those of you with hands up as a primary academic affiliation, how many of you have a full-time identity as a faculty member? In other words, you teach. You do. Okay. We now know whose expenses are being paid. Thank you. <laughs> Not the folks with their hands up. Second category. How many of you are broadly defined in the technology industry and currently provide technology products, goods, or services to higher education? Okay. Thank you. How many of you are in the technology do not currently provide technology, goods, or services, or products to higher education, but you are here for that kernel of wisdom that will launch your product and transform the marketplace? Okay. How many of you are slumming? <laughs> these, are mutu these are not mutually exclusive uh, items. Second question we would like to know is about your current ownership of some kind of e-reader. We're going to talk about e-readers for the higher ed market, but we're going to talk with you with this question in the context of US people in the consumer market as opposed to the tech industry. So first of all, how many of you actually own an e-reader platform? Kindle, Nook, Sony, something that you bought specifically and intentionally as an e-reader? Not an Android tablet, not an iBook, but a, a dedicated e-reader tablet, a uh, platform. How many of you have a platform that has e-reader functionality, iBook, Android, something? How many of you have a Sony e-book reader from 1990? <laughs> this is Sony's, it's, you have one. Are you using it? No. <laughs> no, but you win our respect for being a well-financed early adopter. You will win a prize if, in fact, you have a 1990, 2000, and a 2010 Sony e-reader. If you have the full collection, then we'll talk afterwards. How many of you have downloaded uh, an e-reader app or more than one to some other device? Okay, great. How many of you have downloaded an, an e-book as a consumer in the last two weeks? In the last week? This morning while you were listening to the sessions? <laughs> 
And finally, any of you download a book written by any of the panelists so far today? Okay, great. Uh, finally, how many of you have children in college now? Or at least you think they're still there? Okay, that also. So many of you are here with, with multiple identities. All right, now we're going to go to the technology-aided questions, just to sort of put some of this in context. And for this, you need your clickers. Please bring out your clickers. Wave them high. Everybody show us your clickers. We need a group photo of the clickers for the folks at McMillan, folks. So, great. I'm, there's a whole group here that does uh, Hands up with the clickers, please, in front. Thank you. Are they all on? We need to see the blue lights. OK, great. It's like a rock concert. So, yes. <laughs> And those of you who have two hands, you can wave your clickers and your, you know, your lighter apps. All right. Our first eye clicker question, if we can bring that up the screen, please. Our first eye clicker question. Do electronic reading devices improve or hinder the learning experience for college students? Your options are generally improve, generally hinder, mixed benefits, don't know, no opinion. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, Three, two, one. Data, please, Liz. Let's see what you say. So it looks like overwhelmingly, it looks like 75%, if I'm reading that correctly, is that right? 70%. 6%? No, it looks like overwhelmingly the blue bar is high. So can you bring that back up? Pardon? 52%. The majority, distance, angle. All right, so the majority say yes, you think it does, and then the second group uncertain about mixed benefits. Thank you. Second question. Over the past two decades, colleges and universities have made significant investments in information technology to enhance instruction and scholarship and improve services and administrative operations. On a one to five scale, one not effective, five very effective, how would you rate the effectiveness of higher ed investments in information technology specifically, specifically for teaching and instruction? Ten. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, one. All right. One not, not effective, set five very effective. All right. Or A, rather. I'm sorry. So Pardon? it's split pretty evenly. Uh, and actually, this is really interesting. Earlier this year, in conjunction with Inside Higher Ed, I conducted a national survey of over uh, about 1,050 college and university presidents from across all sectors. We asked them this question about the effectiveness for on-campus teaching and learning. And like you, the numbers were very low. We, we were used a one to seven scale. The clicker doesn't allow us to do that. But the, those who said very effective, six or seven, the numbers were less than 50%. Among the presidents of private research universities, the USC's, NYU's, University of Chicago's, Stanford's, and others of the world, only one in eight indicated that, at, that they thought that the investment in IT for on-campus teaching and instruction had been very effective. Highest rated were libraries. Third and final eye clicker question. This is based on a current event, sort of. In his authorized biography of Steve Jobs, Walter Isaacson cites the co-founder of Apple in his final conversation with Bill Gates, agreeing that, quote, computers had so far made surprisingly little impact on schools far less than on other realms of society, such as media, medicine, and law." End quote. What's your assessment? And again, very specific in terms of the context of the question. Do you agree or disagree that computers have had less impact on education than in other realms, such as media, medicine, or law? So it's not how good they have been compared to impact on other sections. Five, four, three, two, one. A strongly agree. D, strongly disagree. Let's see what we look like. So this group is um, a little bit different than Mr. Jobs. Of course, you are closer to it than perhaps Steve was, uh, or maybe not. No, am I doing this wrong? Strongly agree. Strongly agree. So yeah, it, yeah. Oh, you agree. My apologies. I can't see the screen. So again, so there's a reasonable amount of skepticism that education has lagged compared to other segments about the impact and the benefits of technology. Actually, that's a very good way to sort of set up our conversation today. We have folks who, uh, again, represent different parts of the landscape in the movement to digital curriculum. Uh, disclosure, we had a conference call before the conference. So we have sort of talked a little bit about some of the questions. We have not pre-rehearsed the answers. 
And this is really going to be an open conversation. They, so I want just to let you know, where did that question come from? We've talked a little bit about this before we got here. Uh, but what any of the panel members will say, none of us knows at this point. So the first question, picking up on our, our third clicker question, digital content is, in theory, or may not be, or is it, transforming the learning experience for undergraduates? And if so, how? Jim, you are, other than me, the token academic on the stage in terms of gray beard, gray hair, yes. central casting. And you kind of do some of this for a living at the center. So I'm going to let do. you open on this, if you would. If in, is it transforming? If so, how? Uh, it, it certainly is transforming. It's just that it doesn't seem to be as transformative as it could be. And I think that that speaks to the uh, poll results from the last question that uh, um, was thinking of a line from that famous philosopher, Tom Petty, that uh, the future is not here just yet. Um, I think that um, a lot of the factors beyond just technology, it's about the human factor of getting it integrated into the classroom, the development of ancillaries, as um, my co-panelists know much, about, much more about than I do, but getting it integrated so that the faculty member who is actually in charge of the classroom, uh, since classrooms are not actually democracies, they're participatory but not democracies, um, have a chance to um, fully utilize those so that the development of learning support services at most campuses um, becomes a crucial area. I think in the mix of this, though, is that it's good for faculty. I hope to pay attention to what students uh, and others say. So it's the development also of um, uh, a mix of approaches where um, uh, you'll see print, um, I think, to continue to thrive and provide very important learning experiences. Uh, I think you see some of the ways in which print um, has uh, potential advantages over digital in some ways when it comes to complex arguments. For that, I'd reference the book The Shallows, uh, which has some very good arguments about that. Um, so it's a mixed picture, Casey, and I think, uh, again, we'll see the evolution over the next three to five years. So, so Vineet, McGraw, Pearson, Cengage, Wiley, Bedford Freeman, others are firms with a long history of, of being of providers of print and instructional content to this market that are very much caught up in this in this transition, or what could be the transition. Do you agree with Jim? I mean, are we seeing some impact? Is it an issue, as Jim suggested, about infrastructure related to faculty and also the, the applications that make this possible? Where are we on this? Yeah, so, so I think infrastructure is certainly something to consider. But I, I think, you know, as we look at colleges and universities, it's less of an infrastructure question and more uh, a market readiness question. So I mean, as we've looked at uh, McGraw-Hill anyway, as our peers have as well, looking at what we could do with technology and software in a teaching and learning context, what we figured out is certainly migrating the, the book uh, or the content that's in the book into an online environment is important. But we've also found that there's utility that we can create in an online environment that we couldn't create offline. So for example, making homework more effective and efficient through applications like we've got one called Connect that's got over two million users. And, and it's more efficient for faculty to go in there and collect all the grades and student information. It's also more effective and efficient for students to go in and do their homework online and get immediate feedback. So I don't know if you uh, remember the days. I, I, it's been a few years since I was in college, but I studied engineering. And back in those days, we'd do you know, pen and paper problem sets. I think in half my classes, I may have gotten those back before midterm or final, and it was usually within a couple of days of a midterm or final. So that teaching and learning moment I had when I was doing the homework is lost. Uh, in a software context, we can provide immediate feedback as students are working through that homework su submission, uh, and that's creating uh, you know, a deeper way to engage with them as they're in the process of learning material. So I think certainly we've started down the path, but there uh, are many more steps to take. Sean, your raison d'etre effectively is to make possible what Vineet and the other publishers want to do. Course Smart, correct me if I'm wrong, essentially is owned, supported by the major tech publishers. And as, a, as to be the dis, uh, sort of the creation, development, distribution right. arm for their products in digital format. Where are we on this? You know, if you think about what has happened with technology in higher education, uh, once you get beyond uh, uh, financial aid systems and student record systems and things of that sort, most of it's been around the learning management system. It's been about the infrastructure for managing grade books and things of that sort. And what hasn't happened uh, until only recently is there hasn't really been content available for those types of systems. Uh, and what we do at CourseMart is we enable content to be able to be used in the context of uh, faculty and student workflows, 
so you find right now that, uh, and I'll talk more about some of the implementations that we've done, uh, you find right now the content's available in the context of the learning environment. And that wasn't the case before. Mm -hmm. um, and Matt and Osman, you guys are sort of the new guys on the block in one sense in terms of the history of your companies. Uh, you know, it's the iPad and other tablets are sort of the device that lost 100,000 business plans, certainly a number targeting in education. Yep. As you look at this marketplace. Well, we just, both Osmond and I started our companies before there was an iPad. I understand so. that. I understand <laughs> that. You guys were blessed to have yeah. a non-disclosure agreement while the rest of, us, rest of us were uh -huh, waiting. Yeah, Apple gives those all the time. <laughs> Where are we in, in this in this movement towards digital content is, is, uh, and, and transforming the learning experience? Matt, let me start with you. I, I think we've got a whole bunch of people sitting in garages building mechanized horses. Um, the transition from transportation in a stagecoach uh, to transportation in a Bugatti Veyron. Uh, a Bugatti Veyron, for those of you who don't know, is a W16 engine, 800 horsepower, amazing device. That's what you uh, get you after should, you go public? That's, well, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, <laughs> dig you out know, for those of one. us who watch. Uh, the, yeah, but it, it's not about taking a horse and making a faster horse, right? Ford didn't look at a horse and say, how do we make that better? He had to think, what's the, what's the thing that people do with horses? They get from point A to point B. We need to get from point A to point B on a learning journey, and no one in their right mind today would design a textbook to do that job. But a lot of people are taking textbooks and putting them directly onto tablets and calling it a day. You can add bells and whistles around it, but ultimately that's, that's like putting, trying to put a motor inside of something in the shape of a horse. It's not the right way to do something. You've got to invent a car. You've got to do something that's radically different that does a better job of getting you from A to B. And that's what I think hasn't happened in enough depth yet. I mean, Vinit talks about what McGraw is doing with Connect and having assessment platforms where students take assessment, get instant feedback on how they're progressing, but that's really hard. Not only do you have to write a full textbook to do that in the context of a digital product, but you also have to write an analytics engine, you have to have all of this intellectual property around it, and, and that's the stuff that's interesting and the stuff that's happening very slowly in the garages that I think is gonna redefine this stuff. But So I wanna talk about the garage. Oswald, actually, you tried to design two cars for right. a while. Because you, exactly. you know, Noah's going to do a platform and a software environment. Right. You know, now you're kind of retooled a little bit in the last year. Mm -hmm. uh, where are we in terms of, of designing this environment that's going to help move forward digital? So, you know, so from my perspective, the real transformation is going to come if there's great user experience for the student. Because we can design a lot of good products, but if the students don't accept it, it's, it's, it's not going to work. And I think the biggest area that's taking place right now is how learning is becoming in context, that when you are trying to learn a topic, how information can come to you and at the point of interaction. I think that's the first step of starting this whole transformation. And tablets, I think, are key to that because the, when, you know, as you said, we were building two horses, we were actually building a tablet before the iPad was announced because we really believe that the tablet uh, form factor is the right way for education. All right, so let me actually pick up on, the, on that point, if I may. You've given me a good segue. You said, if students accept it. And, and mm -hmm. for the audience, we're going to come back to, to this in a moment. It looks, as I view the marketplace and my conversations with folks in a variety of different areas, we're seeing two paths to the marketplace of digital trans, the movement to digital. One is along the notion of what we might call e-text. The other are digital products that are based on adaptive learning models. I, don't, I want to hold the adaptive learning conversation aside for a moment, but let me talk about the e-text issue. At least the data that I see, I'm drawing now on Student Monitor, which surveys undergraduate, full-time undergraduates. Last fall, as part of their annual scan with undergraduates, they asked about e-text. Let me just read off some numbers, because it looks like at this phase in the marketplace, student acceptance of e-text, where they have a choice. I can buy a new book, a used book, different formats for my class and widgets, seems to be loose warm. Less than a fifth, 17% of full-time undergraduates have purchased at eText. Remember, many are taking one, two, if they're part-timers, potentially four or five courses. So it's not uh, just a single course. Less than a third of undergraduates, 27%, report being very interested in buying digital books for personal reading, let alone, and even lower, presumably, for their academic. Just 1% of textbooks, according to Student Monitor, uh, in fall 2011 were in digital format. These are e-texts, again, not the adaptive learning titles. Among professors who have had experience with e-texts, the major drivers for use among them was 
my professor required me to do so, a little over a third, 35 percent, followed by less expensive than a traditional textbook, 30 percent. We're going to talk about the cost issues a little bit on. Uh, finally, large numbers of students, two-fifths said that they don't like reading on a screen, and, and 34 percent said they prefer traditional books. Also significant from a student monitor survey in spring 2011, presented with the choice you can buy the widgets book at a constant price, whatever the format, brand new, used, rental, digital. Almost a fifth, 17% said they wanted to buy a used book. Only 4% said they wanted a digital book, 60% said they would buy the new book. The used book number is interesting. It suggests that students see value in somebody else's annotations and highlighting. So let's talk about student acceptance from, from that perspective. Matt, let me start with you. Student acceptance. Uh, this, this is a really painful one for me because <coughs> if I said right now that you could all spend $10,000 to buy, what's the kind of horse that's really, really tall and strong? A Bugatti? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, what is it? Uh, a Clydesdale, Clydesdale, right? So 10000 bucks for a Clydesdale. Does that come with or without Budweiser? Just they're all the same, just okay. like you said. Yeah. <laughs> so they're all, but they're all, they're all the same price. So ten thousand dollars for the Clydesdale, or I can get ten thousand dollars for this modified steel thing with weird mechanics inside that may or may not work. That's got a really hard seat and may or may not come with a saddle for ten thousand. You're gonna take the Clydesdale. I don't care that the Clydesdale's been around for two thousand years. It's a better device, and trying to mimic the Clydesdale in steel mm -hmm. is nuts. So why would anybody want to why would anybody want to do that? So the question for me is fundamentally flawed. Why ask somebody whether they want a PDF of a book? It's worse. The book is better. Well, wait, because you're you assuming that the student monitor question it. was asked a PDF copy. Well, just say it's an ebook. You don't produce e just PDFs. Osmond doesn't just no, produce absolutely. PDFs. Absolutely. Sean would argue that he's also not just supporting PDFs. Yeah. That you all have added value formats for your digital titles. If I could weigh in here, Casey, I, I think it's a flawed argument to set aside the adaptive learning products. Because uh, I actually agree with Matt in that you know, producing a, a, a digital replica of a print book doesn't add a lot of value. But what does add a significant amount of value is the adaptive learning product, where you can provide the content in context, where you can provide assessment and remedi remediation immediately, where you can provide a more engaged learning experience. And in fact, those are the types of products that are in the market today developed by publishers. That's what I, Sean, I want to come back to adaptive learning, because it's a different business plan, in some cases, a different distribution plan. I, I, again, but I'm all of you sure. are investing very heavily in single-use sales to students in terms of taking my widget book and putting it in some kind of enhanced digital format. Jim, you're watching this. Yeah, I mean, if you have, uh, but if the significant uh, student resistance to uh, to e-books that you just cited in those numbers, I mean, that's in, I would think any faculty member, any university ought to pay attention to that. I mean, it's, uh, it can be, it sounds so easy to stand in front of students and you have 16 weeks and they know that their grades, their future, of course, depends on doing well in your course, so you hope, but it, if they really don't engage in the class, if they don't, you know, if, if they really don't commit themselves to learning, and if it's a significant barrier for them to participate in that learning because it's in e-format, then the students may not be ready either. Well, is this a matter of inventory? Is it a matter of infrastructure? Or you all have on your websites extensive inventories, lots of titles that are in various stages of digital transformation. Yeah, can, can I jump in here, Casey? Yeah. So, so look, I mean, we've had ebooks available in one way, shape, or fashion since the days of CD-ROMs, if anyone can remember those days. So I don't think it's necessarily been an availability <coughs> question, frankly. All of our content that we produce is available digitally today. So if, if, if students across the country said, we're not going to buy books anymore, that's fine. We're fine with that. Um, in fact, uh, you know, the business models, we're trying all sorts of different business models around digital books and digital content. Uh, we struck a deal with Indiana University recently. I know Brad Wheeler's here. Um, to, to look at a very different model about content licensing at an institutional level with buy-ups for additional products and services that we make available. Uh, so just, you know, if, if anyone's interested in business models around this, talk to Brad about that. But I, I want to come back to, to Matt's horse analogy again, and let, let me try it a slightly not, not different way. Not to beat way. a dead horse, right? Not, not to beat the dead horse, <laughs> but, but, you know, putting the, the PDF on the screen or the, or the book on the screen is a little bit like putting a horse on roller skates, right? So, so maybe, maybe it's a little faster. <laughs> Uh, you know, may fall down and stumble a little bit here and there, right? You know, your books can crash. I may not search for exactly what I want. Uh, you know, OS upgrades can break my ebook. Same as a, a horse can trip on roller skates, right? So, so I don't think any of us are saying that the that the book on a screen to bring up the numbers that you were talking about earlier, Casey, is the right answer. I think what we are saying, though, 
is that we need to take a look at what's the, the student's uh, interaction with, with their learning experience and how can we make that experience with the content better, more engaging, and more effective as they're going through studying and learning, right? So, so the book, the printed book, it gets often used as a reference. Frankly, it's not even the first reference students go to. Google usually is. Um, so, so if you look at it from, from, from a reference standpoint, that, that's what a book is good for. Uh, content online it ends up being a very different set of content that you need. You need the homework content. You need the instructional content. You need supporting content, like, like the, the faculty lectures. Uh, in digital form, and frankly, that's one of the reasons why we bought a company called Tegrity to, to digitize and make all that content searchable and readily accessible at point of use, point of need, either on a computer click or on, on your mobile device. So I, I think it's really looking at what's happening in teaching and learning and how do we make that whole experience effective on screens. I think that's where Sean w w was heading towards And Sean, well. now I'm going to let you talk about adaptive learning because <laughs> at least it seems to me you're setting up an argument that if the future of the transformation to digital is going to be adaptive learning. What does that say also about what we're seeing to be the investment on, on the part of all your firms in transforming tomes into digital environments that are added value, not just as flat PDFs, but have lots of interactivity that have hot links to the web and have a lot of other stuff. And my, my one other point before I give you a chance to respond, Sean. The issue, I think, with the student monitor data is students, when presented with an e-book as opposed to other choices, there's a choice. My understanding is that in most instances, when they go to an adaptive learning product, there's not an alternative to that. You know, if I need a widgets book, I can buy it in different formats. If I needed the adaptive learning application for my widgets class, there's only one way to get it. It's one branded product and one, one point of access to it. Is that going to be the path to digital transformation? And the book, as we know it, in, whether a print or, anal or, or digital formats, along the lines we're seeing in the consumer market, that's going to go away over time. Now you can go, Sean. You're chafing. Yeah, and I think that is the case. I think we are in a transitional phase right now. And in fact, the fastest growing products in the market right now are, in, are those adaptive learning products. Uh, at this point in time, if you want to compare it to uh, the mass market for e-books, at this point in time, 10% of all revenues in the market are the adaptive learning products. Our Pearson's My Math Lab are the McGraw-Hill Connect products the Cengage Now products and things of that sort. They're tied into the grade book. You heard a speaker on a panel right before lunch talk about how you get engagement up. You get engagement up by tying it into the grade book and by making sure that students can get immediate feedback and making sure that, uh, that, that, that uh, it is, in fact, a required part of the course. One thing I would point out also, Casey, all those books have e-books, all those products have e-books in them. They are not different products. But They're the, the professor typically, Sean, says do the adaptive learning as opposed to get the book. No, I think the, I think the, the professor says interact with the content. You don't just do the adaptive learning. You read the content. You interact with the content. You uh, uh, work on social platforms around the content. You take your quizzes and exams that are tied into the the grade book with that same content. It's a learning environment. Right. So then, Osman, Matt, the need. What does the movement to adaptive learning yeah. mean for your business plans? Can, can I make a bit of a bridge here, which might help us get yes. to the next step in the conversation? Okay. Right. So, so I think where uh, where Sean's going is, you know, everything that that we're collectively doing is about generating outcomes, right? So, so if you look at a course experience, a course experience isn't just about sitting there and consuming massive volumes of content. I mean, if, if, if it were, we'd all be reading encyclopedias and studying Wikipedia from end to end, right? But nobody does that. I mean, it's all about getting a grade, demonstrating some mastery of some material so you can move on to the next uh, set of things and then eventually get towards a credential which helps you get a job, which helps you earn more money, and, and that's kind of where we started the conversation this morning, right? So, so there's very high stakes outcome associated with the consumption of the content. So the question is, is then from a teaching and learning standpoint, what can we do with technology to help promote the engagement with the content, promote the retention of the material, promote that progression so that students can get towards the outcome that they want to get to, which is getting the grade in the course, getting the, getting the credits, getting the degree, and getting a job, right? And so that's where I think we need to collectively push ourselves. If we do that right, where the business model ends up shifting is more towards an outcome-based model and less of an input-based model, right? So today, you know, book, a book is an input into a learning process, right? Same as the faculty lecture is, as are other things that go on in the class. Um, it, it's very tough to make a business just providing inputs. 
uh, I think where we increasingly move to, and adaptive learning helps us get there, is, is in the business of providing outcomes. When we get closer towards outcomes, we, we're starting to see different types of business models emerge, and they end up looking a lot like software models. So, so the licensing models I was talking about earlier start to become more and more prevalent. Matt, awesome. what does this do to your business plans? Because I, I think you know, for, for many students who go to your websites and look at your inventory, it looks like a digital version of something somebody used to call a book. Right. As opposed to a, an all enveloping, yeah, call it a turnkey environment say, or something else. We still say horsepower for cars. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So sir, noted. Sir, you know, from the from the overall perspective, right? How do how do these things come to the student and how do they use it? The biggest mistake we'll all make is we think that let's let's just build some fancy things and the students are going to run to it. When you think of the student. How they they as you know they they really worry about their grade when they come into classroom, and the notion of bringing even assessment to the point of interaction, that's that's key to this whole process. And for companies like us, which are the platform, we expect to work with the publishers where this comes in a consistent manner to the student. Having a student go to you know if you go to Berkeley, you for the for the freshman class there are 29 different publishers. They're not going to go to 29 different sites to do their work, it all has to come to one spot. And it's a transition to get to that point. And you know, so we have students from more than 5,500 universities who use our product. And they are going through this transition where they, we give them what they're comfortable with. We made it extremely interactive. But the biggest thing they use is how they are now able to personalize their book. The fact that they can, they can point out what's important to them throughout the semester and take it in the journal to see what's important to them and only study that, that's, that's where this whole thing is going. It's going to be self-paced learning. It's going to be personalized. Still, you know, saying that a book in a different format is going to work, it's not going to work. It has to be personalized. It doesn't matter what the original book looks like. It's what you end up for your own exam. That's the ultimate goal. Okay, so without going negative, I want to ask you the political question. Four of you are involved in different ways of bringing these things to the marketplace. Again, we're in a political season. Uh, politely and quickly, what differentiates each of your platform, what your platform in the marketplace, Matt? We, you know, people love to pit Osman and me against one another because they think we're competitors. We may be competitors in the sense that Microsoft and Apple are competitors in certain areas, but the reality is that we're solving for fundamentally different problems. Um, Inkling is a platform for publishing complex technical information. We can spin a molecule in 3D. We can watch a video. We can take interactive assessment. We can sell things by the chapter. We can do all of these really compelling things in content to help somebody learn. And we run a risk of conflating the notion of publishing technical information in a digital context with uh, adaptive learning, for example. These are distinct concepts. You can take an adaptive learning set, uh, but you can't do it successfully unless you've learned the content. And learning the content requires you to consume uh, consume that content. So for us, we're differentiated in that the platform allows you to do some really compelling, engaging, interesting, flexible things cross-platform in a very, very scalable way in ways that nobody else can do. That's our big advantage. That's the thing that we're and doing. Awesome. It's not the same as, it's How not the same How does your platform problem. do things that nobody else can do? Look, so it's, um, we do pretty much what, what Inkling just um, Matt just said. Disagree. But on top of it, <laughs> I'm not. I'm, I'm saying we, we, you know, it's, it's all that. But we then allow you to personalize it for your own use. Because as you highlight or as you look at important things in your content, we pull that us out for you to personalize it, which is, I think, the most important thing to do. And Sean, how does CourseMark do things that nobody else can do? First and foremost, I would say that we're not an e-textbook company. That's not what we do. Uh, what we do is we create, we connect content creators with content uh, consumers in the okay. digital space. We spend a lot more time focusing on bringing content into context, integrating with learning management systems, making sure students can get anytime, anywhere access. Michael Powell said this morning that this generation wants to stay informed and plugged in anytime, anywhere. The types of things that we do are uh, emblematic of an implementation that we've, done, that we've done at Western Governors University, where every student, and Western Governors been mentioned a couple of times today, every student in the context of their learning environment has access to their digital content one click. Okay. So that's and where we bring value. Benit, you're involved in this as well. What do you do that nobody yeah, else well, does? And, and so full disclosure, uh, you know, of the three other companies represented here, you know, we're, we're 
partnering with all three, and our content's available on all three platforms, and we're investors in two of them, right? So, so, so that said, <laughs> and we'll talk later, Osman. So, uh, so, so look, I, I think that said, we're also making investments on our own. So I think the, you know, the, the, the quick bit of that and why I think it's important is that I can't predetermine or, or ordain any uh, clear path about what students are going to gravitate towards or what ends up being the best uh, you know, instructional experience for faculty to administer and support. So we're trying lots of different approaches. Uh, and I think from, from an industry perspective, it is important that we do try lots of different things to figure out, we're all learning as we go through is to figure out what's going to work, what's not going to work. And, and we'll make some of those, uh, you know, things on, on our dime in terms of, you know, equity relationships we'll make in partnerships and we're also investing in our own businesses. So I think, you know, ac across that set of activities, we will figure out what ends up being the, the right set of things to accelerate the progression of, uh, of using technology in education to come back to one of the questions we had earlier, where it was, was th this open notion about, okay, so technology's been in education for 20 plus years now. How come the instructional model still looks a lot like an industrial production model or, or an assembly line model where you send 25 kids into a class for 40 minutes at a time? They all experience the exact same thing. Because we need daycare. I'm going to move this along. <laughs> Jim. Um, <laughs> God, I hope I, I, I hope I, I, I hope so, I, so I'm I hope, assuming that I was in just one sense, what going you do, here. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm I, hoping I'm not a daycare provider. No, no, exactly. You're, you're not, uh, personally. Uh, personally. But you get to watch in one sense. So, oh, yeah. you know, so what, based on what you've just heard over the last couple of minutes, what do all these platforms need to do better, or what aren't they addressing that needs to be attended to in this process? Well, they have to be better than the. And I don't know who made it, so I'm sorry if it was anybody's an anatomy textbook that I was looking at at uh, the Learn at UW offices and getting ready for today at the University of Wisconsin, I should say. And um, it was just, a, I don't know, it was a scanned image of a, of a textbook. And it was. So this is like a, the PDF port. Absolutely. So we, we all agree PDF ports don't work. Is that right? Yeah, you just can't have those. And, it's, okay. and so when Matt describes, you know, that same kind of, uh, you know, some kind of product in the field of anatomy. I mean, I can see that the organs would spin, and somehow that somehow somehow that sounds like the kind molecules of a, that are spin, yeah, the organs yeah, function. Yeah, that, that, that's yeah. a nasty okay. action. There we go. Watch what's the molecules spin? But anyway, it uh, it's a. Uh, it, I think it has to have that kind of um, um, interactivity. Part of it is that the students are a mixed bag, that they've been, you've, ex you've explained the reluctance to adapt to some e-learning situations, but at the same time, when it comes to their personal lives, their use of social media, that uh, as somebody who's in his mid-60s, as ought to be pretty obvious, that I find myself sprinting to try and stay just a somewhat behind them instead of light years behind them in terms of communicating with the students and, provi and providing that. It's uh, that I find to be a real challenge. And um, back to the first word I used in the beginning, that the infrastructure that I'm sure I need more assistance in the classroom to become more effective at using uh, e-learning. All right, I want to shift a little bit and talk about one of the elephants in the room, at least as we talk about traditional textbooks going into e-text. And I know that that in and of itself will be controversial with the panel. Last year at this conference, we had a similar panel. Sean, who is again at my far right geographically, when pressed about the issue about sort of what will be the cost of digital books, said, let, and I'm paraphrasing, but I think this is accurate because I went back to look at the tape, let us be clear in a public forum with one another. There are great expectations about textbooks should cost less when they go digital. And yet the movement to digital, and these are almost your exact words last year, Sean, really only saves shipping and printing. And the largest part of the, the process of bringing these things to market in whatever format is the development process. And so therefore, the expectation that digital is going to be a lot less expensive is probably wrong, and we should do some user education about that. Period, paragraph. Uh, let me finish. Let me finish. It's my podium, OK? <laughs> You'll have a chance. You'll have a chance. But as Ronald Reagan said, he bought the microphone in New Hampshire 30 years ago. An hour later. Walt Mossberg, who many of you know by reputation as the technology impresario at the Wall Street Journal, came in for our closing session. Mossberg said he was delighted to be here, talked a little about his history. He was not a techie by training, and just like a lot of folks, was fed up with these things didn't work, 
and somebody needed to talk with them, not for, for mere mortals as opposed to for engineers, went on to say that, uh, yes, he's a trustee of Brandeis, but again, I don't know much about higher education. G, there are a lot of tablets here at CES 2011. That's really interesting. G, textbooks ought to be digital and they ought to be a lot less expensive. There is across the landscape in university offices, in government offices, you know, every place else, this expectation that going digital will be less expensive. Can we bring up the slide, please? So what does it cost? This is a picture of a widely used economics textbook, Essential of Economics, by Gregory uh, Mankow Mankow at Harvard, sixth edition. Thank you. Thank you. My apologies. Thank you. And using uh, some stuff from Verba software, essentially it's a bot that helps students figure out where can I get different price points for different things. You see a scattergram of the price for new used rental and digital um, for this book, which is just released in 2011. If we can go to the next slide, please, Liz. I went to some of those sites, and it turns out, you know, if we begin to look at the, what does it cost for the student to buy the book as opposed to what does it cost for the student to use the book. This was published at Inside Higher Ed earlier today on the Digital Tweed blog. You can get the chart. You don't have to take pictures of it. Turns out that, yeah, no surprise, <laughs> new books, even if they're discounted, are the most expensive purchase option. Let me finish. Used books are about half of the, so of the retail price, not necessarily the discounted new book price. E-books are more expensive than rentals. The least expensive is an international edition. And lo and behold, who knew Amazon was subsidizing free textbooks? Because regardless of where you buy this book and what you pay for it, Amazon, at least as of Monday, would give you a guaranteed buyback of $123 for a new or used book, which meant that you could buy a used book from a couple of sources and have almost zero net cost for use. And I think this is some of the conundrum that we all confront when we talk about the movement of traditional textbooks in a digital format. Who wants to walk into this one? I think, I think prices of e-books have to come down. Absolutely, there's no doubt about it. How we, will that we happen? Agree on that. So Sorry? you all agree prices should come down? Absolutely must come down because look, the, the business case for the publisher is, you know, let's be, let's be clear, publishers don't make money when used books sell. But when an e-book sells, according to copyright laws, you cannot sell a, an, an e-book which means more people are going to buy e-books. So if you decrease the price of e-books, even, even you know, 30% more than, than what you have over here, from, from what we understand, the publishers still come out ahead. And for it to become mass market, the students, the faculty, the parents are price sensitive. It's gonna take time for them to understand the value, the additional value that you get from e-books e to, to understand why they can be slightly higher. But for e-books, e-textbooks to take off, prices must come down. I mean, Mark and Reeson and I, we, we went to see CEOs of, of the major publishers just in October to take the, take, the, take the same information to them that, look, this is not competitive. It won't take off unless you do something about it. Sean, you look like you want to dive into this. Yeah, if you look at the slide right now, Casey, all of the low-priced options up there are ones that the publisher does not get paid for. This is an economic issue. It really is not a content or a delivery issue. Wait and a minute. Fact, I want to clarify this. So uh, the publisher is not, doesn't get anything for the international edition. The publisher doesn't get anything for the e-texts that are provided by those are, those are Those are all of the low-priced editions. I'm talking about the ones that are the used books and the rental books. The used so the ones, books, okay. The used books and the rental books are the ones yeah, so that So there's a one-time on. sale. The publisher makes one sale. It's a one-time sale. You blogged about it, I think, yeah. a year and a half ago. Okay. And yesterday, and, today. And, 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 in, and in fact, Michael Granoff, who's an economics professor at the University of Texas, wrote a New York Times editorial on this topic in August of 2007. And, and this is an economic issue. Mm -hmm. It really is not a content delivery issue. And were there more institutions doing things like Michael Granoff suggested, or things like Brad Wheeler's doing at Indiana University? Right, let's give Brad a Warhol unit. Brad, stand for all the folks that want to assault Brad when this is done. Okay, you'll, you'll find him in the hallway holding court when we finish. Because what's, hap what's happening in those models is is at a very very low fee. All right, the student, every student is enrolled in the content. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, uh, what Michael Granoff at the University of Texas suggested was, didn't make any difference whether that was print or whether it was uh, uh, a digital, but if every student is enrolled in the content, 
And if the publisher is, in fact, the content creator, and that's not just the publisher, it's the author and everybody else who creates it. So you have a guaranteed sale, 100% if, 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 use. Then your prices are going to go down significantly. Okay. And, in fact, that's actually what Osmond is saying here, because if you can't resell the ebook, it could be necessarily much, much less expensive. But it's but it not would have today. To be, but it would have to be 100% adoption. Right. But it's and, not and today. So, I mean, you yeah. know, as we look at it, in, in, uh, and as Sean appropriately noted, it's not only the, the publishing company or, you know, and we're effectively content actors. Aggregators. Not only do we not get paid on, on secondary and, and, and third and fourth uses of the content, but it's really the authors who don't get paid. And frankly, the authors are the ones who invest a lot of time, effort, and scholarship to, to create that and curate that content in the first place, right? So, um, you know, if we believe that that, that content and that uh, experience with the content has value, then you would think that the people who are spending the, the, the time, effort, and energy to do that should get compensated for the work that they're doing. Right? Matt, do you want to get in on this one, or do you want to pass? Uh, do I have about an hour? No. Uh, <laughs> you have about 30 seconds. No, I think in, I, you know, this is one place where you'll find Osman and I in violent agreement that, in general, the higher the price uh, of the digital product, the less likely this transition is to occur. Uh, if you go into a school with 100% adoption, where every student is getting a copy baked into their fees or whatever, just like their seat and their lights and Wi-Fi are baked into their fees, the school is not paying $177 a copy, I guarantee you. Um, Inkling, actually, the majority of Inkling's business today, just from a revenue standpoint, is in medical and business schools, where we do a very brisk business, providing a lot of you know, interactive uh, anatomy and physiology content to students. But the school licenses that content, and they pay a fraction of what it would be at list. And I think that is actually one of the, uh, the great steps we can take forward, is if the institution has leverage over the publisher in distributing the content, then the institution can, A, guarantee to the publisher they're going to get their dues on every single student, and B, force the price down for everyone. So the solution looks to from. be, in what I'm inferring from what you're, you're, several of you are saying different ways, is effectively we go to curricula as a lab fee model, as some of the for-profits have done. Jim, what do you think? Well, it, boy, uh, uh, do they do this at large Big Ten universe, style yes. universities? Yeah, yeah, Brad's okay. doing it. All right, yeah, yeah it's because uh, it, uh, Wisconsin, it uh, it's a scattered place, marketplace for physical materials, for physical books as well as for uh, e-books, and uh, it's uh, not it's hardly unknown for students not to purchase the textbook at all. Um, <laughs> it uh, uh, so if in fact so if you get the hundred percent that Sean was talking about. Yeah. And that Matt would like, and all of you would like, if in fact you go to a lab fee model, yeah. the materials are licensed to the institution, the institution acts as the distributor, and how many of you run college bookstores in the audience? Yeah. Yeah, your, your, your business model changes in some way. Right. But, but, the, but more, you, more soft goods as opposed to. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I understand exactly how mass purchasing would work to reduce the unit costs. It, uh, it's going to be immediately reflected in terms of tuition increases, I would think. Well, it's, and, so, then, so, so and then that becomes a, it's yeah, actually, it's actually, actually but is, is the tuition, how it actually ends up working. Is the tuition increase, yeah. though, offset by it's, the fact that the bucket that you assign for the cost of attendance goes down? It, yeah, it's it, not so much a tuition increase, right? The way the mechanics on this work, and by, and by the way, we've been actively promoting these kinds of options to enhance affordability, and that's, that's how we hooked up with Brad, and we've been actually talking to folks on your campus too, Jim, about this, is, is we're all about promoting affordability because we think access to education is critically important for our collective economic success as a mm -hmm. country. So we're doing what we can to promote and enhance affordable options and have been out the last couple of years talking about and trying to convince institutions to go to this uh, licensing uh, model. And, so, and, so and Benita, Benita, I want to pick up on that. Stop. <laughs> Great power uh, comes with great responsibility. I don't get I'm not a, I want to move us on about the convincing issue, because actually you've given me a nice segue. We've not yet talked about faculty in this conversation. Textbooks, curricular materials effectively are directed by. You will buy these materials. Hopefully, you will need these materials, presumably, to be successful in my widgets class. Where are faculty in this conversation? Jim, you're a faculty member. You study faculty members on this stuff. Yes, and, and, and know many of them. It, it's interesting that one of the real changes with uh, e-learning e, e materials is the uh, approach goes directly from the publisher, such as my colleagues on the panel, uh, to the professor in some cases. Some cases, yes, on the campus, um, uh, the campus basis, but it's, it, uh, it's that education of the faculty and how the materials will be used, and then for the faculty to understand the ways in which they can be customized, um, perhaps to work in a world with print, 
uh, too, uh, in those particular classrooms. Vinit, you've got a whole sales force that talks to the faculty. I mean, the publishers traditionally have, traditionally have had lots of feet on the street knocking on faculty doors. Yeah, and, and we still do. We all collectively employ probably a couple thousand folks to do this. And so what, what we've all been talking to faculty about is not only the options that all of us have available in books, but frankly all, all the other software and, and workflow tools that, that we provide as well. Because I think, you know, again, it comes back to, you know, what happens as we go online. It's not just books to e-books. It's books to e-books plus personalized learning, plus the homework tools, plus uh, tools to support faculty in building in, in maintaining online courses, and a whole bunch of other things that, that we're bringing to market as well. So, uh, and, and let's be very clear that the, the investment that publishers make materials, not just the content for students, but to support faculty is a fairly significant one in terms of instructional guides, test sets, and other kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, tens of millions of dollars a year, right? So, all right. I, mean, I want to give the other three panel members yeah, quickly so you, an opportunity wanna, on this, and then we're going to move on right. to the audience. Anybody right. else? Yeah, so the, you know, the future for learning itself is going to be under, based on analytics, underlying analytics, which will give feedback to the professor. So at some point, the professors will have to have a consistent system for their class, for everyone in the class, to be able to say, how, what is the behavior of my class in my classroom? So I think the, the role of the professor is going to continue and become even more stronger to the point where they will start to, to say, go to this particular place to get your book, unlike, unlike what they have right now, where they just say, go get the book. Sean? Yeah, I, I think this is a lot an education and awareness issue on one level. Uh, and helping faculty members be comfortable with the digital world. Uh, as you may know, we actually support a platform for publishers to provide digital copies to professors. We have nearly two million professor accounts on our system right now, and it's a means of helping them feel comfortable with the products, helping them access the products. Uh, as we raise awareness and we, as we raise utility, I think you'll see the uptake follow. Matt? Uh, from the audience, what's the other industry, other than higher education in particular, where we complain about cost? Healthcare. Healthcare. What's the other industry in the world where someone prescribes something that has no control over the cost and someone else is basically forced to buy it? Healthcare. So uh, <laughs> doctors give you a prescription for Prozac and you gleefully go and spend $400 on a bottle of Prozac or in fact your insurance company does. This is the other market where that economic system is broken. So when we talk about cost, you've either got to decide that you're going to marry the decision maker and the buyer under one roof, or you've got the professor making the decision, but the software has to come from the professor's budget, or you marry the decision maker and the buyer at the student. And there you give the student the power to decide what they need and what they don't need to get through the course. That's why, for example, Inkling sells by the chapter, so that a student can just buy the chapters they think are going to be useful for their course. So that is what's fundamentally broken with the cost model, and if we can get it to one or the other, and not this sort of uncomfortable middle pharmaceutical model, okay. there'll be a lot more pricing control. Right. Just, just one caveat about the cost slide also. Uh, Matt, uh, I did not intentionally ignore you on that slide. I looked to see if this title was available in your, in your inventory, and at least as of well, Monday. I, uh, you know, what's wasn't. funny is that this title in particular <clears throat> is no longer available from some other distributors up there, because that publisher in particular has decided that they're going to go it alone on okay. a lot of stuff, so don't worry about it. Thank you. All right, we're going to open this up for questions from the audience. Uh, once again, we remind you, please tell us who you are and your affiliation so we can make all kinds of inappropriate inferences about your questions. Let's bring up the lights. Also, keep the questions short. Uh, keep the questions short, and I will interrupt you as I did other folks. Sure. Now is your opportunity, sir. All right. So um, I'm uh, Ed Madison. I'm a professor of computer science and IT at West Point. And um, so we're on this journey of going from allowing the students, we told them exactly what they had to buy, to slowly moving to now. We still tell them what content they have to have, but we don't any longer tell them where they have to get it. Um, and, we, and I have a McGraw-Hill rep that comes and sees me every semester. But it, it seems that that's not in his interest to move toward e-books and e-learning things because he no longer gets the credit for those because he's on a he's on a commission model so yeah. uh, and you can address that after but my okay. question was why do you feel like it has to go toward a hundred percent adoption in order for the cost to come down when right now only 25 percent of the textbooks every semester at West Point are brand new textbooks the rest are used so you don't get money you're not getting money as a publisher for 75 percent of the content or that's being used every semester anyway so it seemed like every e-textbook that would be sold would be revenue that you're not getting now. 
Jump ball, 10 points. Yeah, and so the economics, I think, are, are fairly simple there. Uh, if you have a textbook that costs $100 and it's sold new, and only one in the five times that it actually is uh, 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 purchased, it gets, the publisher gets paid. That means there are four or five times that the publisher doesn't get paid. If, you, if the publisher got paid on all five instances, for the same $100, the book could cost $20. So the, econ the economics are, again, fairly simple in that you know, the publisher could earn the same $100 or the author could earn the same $100 if five students bought it for $20 as compared to one student buying it for $100. Look, I think the authors, authors are going to make more money when, when e-books happen. There's no doubt about it. And it's really, you know, if you take a look at it, many of the major publishers are public entities. And there's a whole financial angle to it that if, if your price of new books goes down suddenly and it takes time for the market to develop the e-book e and, and that begins to take off, there may be a couple of quarters of you know, stress and sweat in, in front of the public markets. So, so they have to think of that as well. But somehow, one way or the other, they need to get over that hump because the model for e-textbook is gonna work out much better for them and it's in transition, and I think we can't afford to wait for the publishers to do all the deals with the institutions, because that's going to take time. And you know, the country needs you know students to be able to get e-textbooks because it's a much better experience, and they learn more right now. It has the potential yeah. to be a much better experience. Again, some student yeah, interaction and, and, and data you'll, you'll and Jim's that. work would suggest that we're you know in some cases we're not there yet. Yeah, you know, we're, we're actively promoting the shift to e-books, whether it's through license models or whether it's through, uh, you know, rental models. Frankly, through all of your applications, our content's available as well as well as through our own application. So, so I think we're we're very happy and aggressively trying to to make that shift happen. Right. Uh, yeah. I just want to clear yeah. up the the misperception on, on the on the sales rep issue is that we don't dictate, mandate, recommend even any channel. So. Uh, once your professor has chosen to adopt a, a title, then our, our rep's fine, regardless of where the content gets secured after that. Please. Question over here. If uh, you would stand and deliver, yes. please. You uh, are. My name is uh, Nick Barnard. I'm a startup with, in Seattle, Washington that's tangentially related to education, but as a recent college student. Uh, my question is, is moving to the model that the institution licenses the content for me and it's part of the class, once I'm no longer associated with that, do I lose all that content? Because today, I still have textbooks on my shelf that I decided were useful, that I wanted oh, to keep. Oh, they all wish everyone was like you. Yes, I know. <laughs> but trust me, I sold a whole bunch of them back, too. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, look, I, I think you know, it, it's, it's, in, uh, you know, it's a question of, of what's the most important thing to a student, right? So, so I studied engineering, initially thinking I was going to become an engineer. Well, obviously, that didn't happen, right? So. Uh, so I still have some of those engineering books that probably aren't worth a heck of a lot in the secondary market, but I'm sure one of Osman's uh, prior companies would help me uh, liberate those if I chose to do so. So look, I, I think for the, for the students who want to keep the content, there are options available. Uh, in what, even if you go to an institutional license model, we're, we're looking at, uh, at those types of things as well. So you can use it first semester, and if students want to use it for longer than that, we'll, but, we'll work with folks. Yeah, I want to talk with the digital folks, though. My foray into the web, at least with the one title, with the exception of Kindle, which was a past edition, 5e as opposed to 6e, you're all doing rentals. You're not doing purchase. So, for, I'm sorry, your name is? So Nick. Nick, who wants to buy and keep textbooks, particularly if they're going to be, have professional value long term, engineering, accounting, computer science, buys a digit, rents a digital edition of widgets, he can't do that beyond the 180 days unless the cost is going to be significantly different. Yeah, right I, 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 do, I do think that model will change, Casey. We do have rentals right now, but we're looking at a permanent access model. Okay. And in fact, you'll see that from us on the, on the near term. So, you know, there's nothing about digital that precludes permanent access. And, in and fact, will they I, be price differentiated? Uh, they, they, they might be. You know, okay. they, they, might, they might be. You and in fact, I do think oh, that yeah. Brad Wheeler at Indiana <laughs> University did license content for the length of time that the student is in the school. So. Uh, and it could conceivably be licensed for longer than that. Okay. And since I'm standing right next. Okay, so <laughs> who wants to rent a copy of Microsoft Windows for three months? <laughs> right? It's a, this is not a model that works. In the, in the world of physical goods, you rent a car, you rent a VHS tape, you rent a house. You don't rent digital things. The word rent is silly. It's a limited time license that expires and your rights go away. 
there's no uh, economic value to anybody upstream in taking those rights away from you because there's nothing to recycle, which is why when you buy something inside Inkling, you keep it for life across all platforms, and it's why CoreSmart, rightfully so, is, is moving to that model with their system too. This is, you know, the, the rental thing is a leftover, it's a digital carryover, it's an example of one of those horse things that comes in from the physical world that we don't need, and we need to do away with it. All right, Brad, your yeah. moment with the microphone. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, Brad Wheeler. <laughs> <laughs> One quick statement. We've been at this since 2009. We've structured pilots with many of the, the uh, content providers. Every question you have raised and thought about faculty prerogative students, longevity of access, printing, software platforms, devices, we've been through it all. It's on our FAQ. We've rolled out. We're live. It's in production through deals with some of these guys. The, the thing I'll ask the panelists that is extremely encouraging to me is I think all of us who've had our eyes on this problem for a while, we're reaching this point of violent agreement. If, if, the public, if the publishers and the authors can get paid for each use of their content, by economics, they can substantially drop their prices. And that's good for students, it's good for degree completion and all institutions have to be involved. If we've all reached this point of violent agreement, why is it moving so slowly? Well, Good Brad, question. I think uh, Brad, I think the reality there is that some of the institutions haven't reached that point yet. I mean, you you do have uh, you do you do have a particular situation that you're working on. Uh, I'm not sure that there are many institutions that are at the point where they're ready to make the leap from academic freedom and student choice to a licensed model. We have we have not seen that yet. We've seen some of it, and I think as I think it is a partnership between the platform provider the content provider and the institution. You need all three of those people in the mix. You know, for, from, my, from yeah. my perspective, it, it's really, you know, a financial market issue for the major publishers because for them to suddenly make a dramatic change, numbers are going to decrease because, you know, new book prices are going to go down and the uptake might not happen overnight. So it's going to take time and they are moving towards it, but they're also trying to figure out how much of assessment product are they going to sell in lieu of the, the actual book. And you know, one of the big things we have to be careful about is their content providers and their platform providers. If the content providers try to become platform providers, then there's a whole challenge to being a software company. And software, you know, so we are not in the content creation business. So somehow, over time, they also have to work together much better. And I think it's, it's in the transitional stage where these things are being discussed openly with many of these guys. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know we're at that stage where I think we're getting close to a tipping point. So, so we've been out in the last couple of years pounding the street to find folks like Brad who are willing to experiment and, and move to the institutional license model and take that that step, which for, for a lot of folks is, is a big step to take because uh, other folks in, in your position at other institutions are happy to have the conversations, and I've had them with with, with those people. And then they're like, great, sounds good, but I have no control over my faculty, so they're gonna do whatever they choose to do in the way that they want to do it, right? So um, I think as they're ready to, to make those uh, types of decisions, and engage in those conversations, we're happy to do it. And, and, and I don't, you know, I'm not as sanguine as Osman is about, uh, you know, the issues of us being public companies having to work through that. Frankly, I've been in meetings with, with a number of our large investors and they understand uh, the issues associated with the shift in the business model and the decline in price points uh, in, in the in the impact on, on our business and it, it ends up being uh, fine once appropriately educated but uh, apart from that education it can be scary but but I think once we get yeah, through right. that with them and we have um, it, it's less of a concern which is why we're actively promoting it. Okay so. panel I want to talk about one thing that could potentially be very scary for some of you and uh, mm -hmm. an elephant that's not in the room but could be here in the, before we took to the stage Josh Fishman was doing his top ten issues and on one of his slides, he very prominently showed the picture of Cable Green, who has emerged as the face and to some degree the force, uh, iconically, for the open courseware movement, open course content movement. What does that do to this conversation if that gels? There's a conversation in state capitals. There was an editorial in the LA Times earlier this week supporting this movement. Since so much of the money indirectly, the argument goes, comes from student aid that goes to students to buy the materials that you folks bring the market. Uh, issues that are going on in Washington State, conversations uh, again in Washington. What does this do to the conversation if, in fact, open courseware, open course reserves, open course content begins to, to take form? Jim, let me start 
with you. You get to watch. Yeah, no, um, I, I did my first ebook in 2006, and uh, because of the way I raised the money, because academic books don't pay for themselves, uh, monographs and the like, uh, I, we arranged to have it be available open access through the University of Wisconsin library system. The telling part was that uh, the number of purchasers was, ex was exceeded by, I think, a factor of about 16 uh, times as many people who chose to download it for free. It, for my colleagues on the panel, that, um, that's got to present uh, uh, an overwhelming barrier to creating textbooks, which are very complicated, particularly when you talk about the adaptive learning. Give you all about 20 seconds on this one, going just down the panel. Sean, what do you think? This actually came up last year, Casey, I think, on the panel. And you, you get to the issue of compensating the author and having the right sort of environment for uh, curated content development. Uh, and I think you actually had a faculty member stand up in the room last year and say, I'm not going to work five years on a book and not get compensated. So there is the economic issue of how you compensate the content creator that I think will need to be dealt with. Right. And uh, also, let's be very clear that when textbook publish when publishers sign authors for educational content, they're looking at a franchise, not a product. You, you are not looking for 1E. You are looking to build 1E into 40E. Uh, best example of that, probably for most of us, is Samuelson's book on economics. Yeah. Vineet, what do you think? Yeah, and by the way, they don't all get there, right? So it's a bit right. of a portfolio question. Yeah, too. there's a risk so, manager. So some, yeah. some get there and a lot don't, yeah. and you've you got to pay for all of them, by okay. the way. Um, so, so, so look, I, I think it, it's, uh, it, it's a simple question of, you know, do textbooks go the, the way of newspapers and magazines and a lot of other things? And frankly, I've only been in this industry six years, so I don't think that that has to happen. Um, I think if we, if we simply continue to provide textbooks or the PDF on a screen equivalents, then, then the future doesn't look so great. Um, I, I think the, the onus is on us to really uh, figure out how we can continue to provide value or additional sources of value in that study, learning, teaching experience, everything from homework to the adaptive learning applications that we talked about, to, to faculty support tools and the like. Because if we don't get deeper into the value chain, frankly, at some point in time, those things become a, a significant threat. To our Osmond and me, it's my open courseware book going to be on your platform? Yes, we actually have one um, from 20 Million Minds Foundation for stats. It's uh, being used by 25 different community colleges in California. Okay. And um, you know it was available for for um, for free, and you know so we learned a lot. The biggest problem with open source books today is faculty don't even consider them as textbooks because you know most of them are available online and they're actually highly unusable as a book, and no one really is going to put any effort together to properly curate them and make them into something usable. Mm. So th the value that the publishers add in curating the textbook is very important. And look, textbook content eventually will get commoditized. It'll get you know, into assessment systems and adaptive learning platforms. But there is still a body of knowledge that is needed to master a topic. The content is still needed. Maybe it's not, it's not in the sh shape of a book. Osman, I'm sorry. I've got to cut you off because they're telling me I have to cut you off. Matt, you get the last 10 seconds on this and everything there's, else. There's going to be demand in the market for a product that ranges from the $2,000 car to the Bugatti Veyron. And the consumer is going to have a choice. And that, is going to require different platforms. So there's going to be room in the market for open, free courseware. There's going to be room in the market for expensive products. This one's not free. Check it out. It's in your bag. Shameless plug. But if you want to try something at the higher end, All right. I, I, had, I had to do it. I had to do it. It's in your bag. All right. I hope you will thank, thank you join all. me in thanking our panel.